Friends, welcome. Welcome to the Calvin Symposium on Worship 2020. We're really glad that you are here. The Spirit has gathered us here from all around and brought us to this place to worship. And the Spirit now calls us to worship with these words from the prophet Isaiah. Hear these words from Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will be faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Let us pray. Everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth, you have gathered us from the ends of the earth to this end of the earth, all of which you have created you have made us and given us breath. And you have given us an amazing promise that you meet us here by the Spirit to give us life, to give us encouragement. We acknowledge those of us in our midst who may be coming into this worship service with some weariness, with some heaviness and some burdens not just because of the time of day, Lord, but because also of their ministries and their service to you. But we trust that you are here uniting us in Christ. Cover us with the blood of Jesus that we may approach your throne in worship and give us strength by your spirit. Strengthen those who are weary that they may truly live into this promise to run and not be weary, to walk and not faint as we wait on you. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you all please rise in body or in spirit? We invite you to sing with us, move your body with us, rejoice in the Lord with us. All right, come on, put your hands together like this.
Okay, so we want to teach you the chorus of this next song. This song says, the earth shall know that our God is God. It really looks to the church to be God's representatives of love and grace and mercy and justice and righteousness on the earth. And when the church really sees itself as it really is, when the church sees itself as God sees it, we will be a testimony of light and a witness to the world. And the world has to confess that our God is God. Okay, so let's try the chorus. Oh, I'm out of breath. And the earth shall know God's name, and the earth will see God's praise, and all of the earth shall see the praise of our God, of our God. Y'all try and the earth, and the earth shall know God's name, shall know.
greatness. We sometimes come aware of our notness. When confronted with the holiness of God, we become more and more aware of our own sin. And I think that that's okay. I think it's okay for us to be aware of our sin because when we're aware of our own sin, we're aware of our need for God. So let's just take a moment to just be present with God and with each other and be honest about our sin with him and with ourselves. God, we thank you for your greatness, for your power, for your majesty, and for your might. You are king and lord over all, forever exalted, forever enthroned. We thank you because you are high and holy. Yet you love us so much. You desire to be with us so much that you give us access to you through your son, Jesus Christ. And we are so grateful. We are grateful that because of Jesus Christ, we have access to the Father. We have access to his presence and we can come into his presence boldly. We can approach the throne of grace boldly. And God, we thank you that whenever we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins. God, I pray that each one of us would have a habit and a posture of repentance each and every day. That we would bow ourselves in humility in your presence, recognizing that you are God and we are not. You are the exalted one. And it's only your love that exalts us, that's it. So God, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your presence here. In Christ's name, let all God's people say, amen.
I know it's early in the morning, but did anyone come to praise God? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for that blessed gift that you not only came to dwell among us in fleshing your word through Christ, but you came to dwell among us in spirit filling us with your presence, inviting us in. So we pray in this time that you would open our hearts to receive you. God, some have come burdened, some have come tired, some have come stressed or worried or anxious, but we pray for release in your spirit. And we thank you, God, that in this moment of worship, in this time, this ordained time, you will open our hearts to receive you. You will open our eyes to see you. You'll open our ears that we might hear you once more. 
So thank you, God, for illuminating our lives. Thank you for enriching our lives by your word. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray that all God's people say amen. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Remember this portion of the story of God as it is written in the book that we love from Peter's letter to the exiles of the dispersion. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hopes on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the ways you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct, for it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. If you invoke as father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear, during the time of your exile. For you know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways that were inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. For he was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born anew, not of perishable but imperishable seed through the living and the enduring word of God. For it is written, the flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his powerful and rich word. Can we give the Lord praise for all who have led us in worship thus far? For Urban Doxology, for this amazing dance team. And I'm Baptist, so you know, in moments like these, we turn to your neighbor and say, and thank God for you too. It's really just to make sure we don't miss anyone. You know, because yes, Please do, just thank God for you too. (laughs) 
you've heard the word of the Lord. And this morning, we will set our hearts around this theme, living as holy. What does it mean to live holy? If you Google uh, the term living holy, you get a whole variety of things. Trust me, I tried it. (laughs) You get everything from holy, literally like with holes in it, shirts, to certain diets that are holy, to certain places that are perceived as holy. My dad is a Baptist preacher, and when my sister and I grew up, we were church kids. Any church kids in the house? (laughs) And when you're a church kid, you get exposed to all kinds of churchy things. And I can remember the days when we would go to worship down the street from our house, right, near uh, Towson, Maryland, and there was a Pentecostal church. And praise God, there was a whole sense of what it meant to be holy, praise God. And one would wear a doily on one's head, praise God. And one would speak of oneself in third person as one is doing at one's moment right now. In holiness culture, there are no earrings or makeup or certainly not pants for women, praise God. No such thing as dancing or holding hands and certainly no drums, praise God. And when we think about our typical images of holiness, it begs the question, is holiness still relevant for times like these? Holiness is unpopular. I mean, when was the last time you had a conversation with a friend about your desire to be more holy? (laughs) This lack of conversation, this lack of popularity around holiness can lead to lack of understanding. Is holiness what we wear or is holiness what we eat? Is holiness a denomination or is holiness a form of worship? When we fail to engage in understanding of holiness, we fail to understand who we are and who God calls us to be in times like these. You see, holiness is not just about what you do. Holiness is about who you are. If you are in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you are holy. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are holy. And you are holy not because of what you wear, not because of where you go, not because of how you worship, not because of what you eat or how many times you say, praise God, praise God. You are holy because God, your Father, is holy. You are holy because you've been born again. To be born again is to be born of different lineage. Yes, you were born to your earthly parents, but when you acknowledged your faith in Christ, you received a new identity. You became new. And if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And your newness is tied to your lineage as a child of God, not born of the flesh, but of the spirit. You are holy because God, your parent, is holy. Your being now prompts your doing and not the other way around. We aim to live holy because we are holy and not the other way around. And contrary to Google searches, this is not a conversation about rules. This is a conversation about identity. And at the core of every crisis is often a crisis of identity. Because when you don't know who you are, you will fall for anything, you will go anywhere, you will believe anyone, you will do anything. When you don't know who you are, you will allow culture to shape you instead of shaping your culture. And when you don't know who you are, you will be all tempted like other people to walk like other people, to live like other people, to be just like the world. 
But you have not been made new to be like you were of days of old. You were not made new to live like you used to live. We are called to live into who we are in Christ. We are called to live holy, set apart, consecrated lives because we serve a holy, set apart, consecrated God. And this is the only way we'll survive times like these. These are the times when people are searching for answers, wondering what happens to famous people and their children when they die. These are times when young people wonder whether or not the faith of parents and grandparents is worth following at all. These are times when people wonder if caring for the poor and working acts of justice are political things or gospel things. These are times when people are longing for answers, longing for community, longing for safety in this world full of trouble and violence and pain. The call to be holy is more relevant now than ever before. The call to live what you believe is more important now than ever before. Because younger generations are calling out for the called out. People are searching for lifestyles that will set them apart from the crowd. And the solution is not found in the latest prescription despite compelling commercials. The solution is not found in flying superheroes or ice princesses or force-filled Jedi or good Samaritans. The solution for our pain and the solution for our world is found in our holy and righteous Savior, Jesus Christ, our King. And the only way to survive the evil of this world is to live differently, to live counterculturally, to live radically. Yes, the only way to survive in these last days is to live holy. In this context of the scripture, Peter is writing to believers in Asia Minor who were trying to survive the evils of their times. Persecutions were rampant and suffering was commonplace. There was temptation to be like the world so that you could survive. But Peter writes them this encouraging letter. And in summary, he's saying to them, don't give up. God has more for you. And in this season of darkness and trouble, Peter understood this was not a time for simple behavior modification. This was not a time to tell them just what to do. This was a time for identity affirmation, a time to tell the people who they were in Christ. It was a time for Peter to remind them what it meant to be holy in times like these. And if you and I are going to survive these times, if, if we're going to bear witness in this world, we will have to affirm who we are in Christ and affirm how we live for Christ as a reminder that we are holy so what does that mean to live holy? Well, perhaps the text suggests that living holy means living with a different mind. To live holy is to live with a different mind. In verse 13, uh, Peter starts and says, therefore, so not necessarily a start, but a continuation, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And then the King James eloquence, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. In short, being holy means changing the way you think. Some might call this orthodoxy or right doctrine, right thinking. When we become born again, set apart and made new, our state of being changes the way we think. And all of a sudden, our, our minds are energized and revived by some thoughts, by being drained and traumatized by other thoughts. Thoughts of God and of God's word start to bring us peace and joy, while thoughts of other things start to bring us down. Did you know from the moment you woke up this morning until this moment right now, you've been bombarded with at least 1,000 messages from the world? Marketing specialists say that the average person receives three to 5,000 messages before the end of their day. Messages about how you ought to dress or what you ought to think about yourself. Messages about what you think the day might hold or what the weather might be. 
And there's a certain um, uh, pushing down, a certain uh, calcification that happens when we only allow our minds to think on things of this world. You know how it works. The moment you decide to live holy is the moment the attack begins up here. All of a sudden, the, the thoughts of the enemy start to invade your mind. Thoughts like, you're not good enough. Who are you to do that? You'll never amount to anything. It's not worth following at all. But there's a certain renewing that happens when we uh, allow our minds to think on God. And this holiness is reflected in the way that we think. Because there is no changing of behavior until there is a changing of the mind. Peter was the perfect example of this. When he first met Jesus, you can just tell that he had an unchanged mind. When Peter began to follow Jesus, it was his self-confidence that led him to walk on water, but that didn't take him very far. Perhaps it was his pride that led him to say he'd never deny Jesus, but that didn't quite work out for him, did it? Some say it was his self-righteousness that led him to cut off the ear of the servant, but that wasn't exactly what God wanted. You see, Peter's actions were a reflection of how he thought. And while he was with Jesus, we could tell that his mind had not yet been transformed. But being filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter finally understood what it meant to be holy. And the Peter we meet in Acts is not the Peter we met through the Gospels. The Peter who stood before the crowd and declared the gospel to thousands and thousands of Gentiles and Jews is not the Peter we knew from before. The Peter who, who accepts the understanding of fishing for men was not the Peter we knew before. And the difference I would suggest to you is Peter was transformed in his mind. Being of a different mind, Peter was able to do for God what he could never do for himself. And Paul says it best in Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in that perfect will of God. The only way that you and I can live holy is to live with transformed minds. And when we transform our minds, we can think more of God than we do of ourselves. We can think more of the needs of others than we do of ourselves. When God transforms our minds, we recognize, as Isaiah said, that our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. But if we keep our minds stayed on him, he will keep us in perfect peace when we keep our minds stayed on him. When our minds are stayed on God, he will give us strength to cast down thoughts that are contrary to his thoughts. And when our minds are stayed on him, he will minimize our anxieties and maximize our peace. He will restore our hope and destroy our doubts. With transformed minds, God reminds us of who we are because we belong to him. We are holy because he is holy. To live holy means to live not only with a different mind, but also with different motives. To live with different motives. In verse 17, Peter says, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. It's as if Peter is saying, we live holy and set apart lives because we have a different reason for living. We've been redeemed by the holy, priceless blood of Christ. And that is our motive for living holy in this world. Some might call this orthopraxy or doing what is right. The call to live holy is a call to live interim lives. It's a call to live lives as refugees, as immigrants in this foreign land that does not belong to us. The call to live holy lives is a call to live knowing that the end is near. It is a call to live in the tent of the temporary, never getting too deeply settled where we are, knowing that this place called earth is not our home. And when you live this way, you live with a certain urgency to do what is right before living ends and judgment begins. Peter calls this reverent fear. Now for the 21st century Christian, using fear of God as a motivator for holy living is not very attractive at all. 
psychologists would tell us that using fear as a motivator is a recipe for trauma and dysfunctional behaviors. So how is it that our loving God would spur us toward holiness with reverent fear? Perhaps the answer lies in our redemption. Peter goes on to say that the reason why we should live holy and the reason why we do what is right is because we have been bought with a price. We are not redeemed by silver or gold. We're not purchased uh, by some uh, blemished animal. No, we were purchased and redeemed by the priceless, faultless blood of the lamb. And through him, our holiness is affirmed and our hope is made certain. When we know the cost of our redemption, it makes our holiness that much more real. And when I know the sacrifice that Christ has made for my life, I will choose to do what honors him. Therefore, I don't engage in immoral behavior just because I want to please him. I don't do or say or go certain places because I want to bring God joy. And even when I'm tempted to think less of myself, the cross becomes the motivation for my desire to do holy things and to be holy because he's holy. When my dad was growing up, my mom and my dad grew up in the projects of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I remember my dad telling me the story about the time he got his first brand new pair of shoes. You see, my dad had hand-me-downs for most of his life, but when he got to about the 10th grade, he had his first pair of brand new shoes. My dad went, uh, was among the first wave of people in Pittsburgh that integrated schools. And he said he came into school and, and ran into uh, somebody that got into a fight with him. And he said, all I was thinking was, don't step on my shoes. He said he got into this altercation and lo and behold, the brother across from him stepped on his shoes. As my dad recalls the story, he said, I absolutely lost it. He was called to the principal's office and his parents uh, being uh, products and at that time or, or really pioneers of the civil rights movement came in guns blazing. What did you do to my child? What happened in this unjust moment? When they found out that my dad got into an altercation with somebody because he got his shoes stepped on and he said he got the beating of his life. I know we're not supposed to spank children these days, but in my father's day, he got the beating of his life. And he said, as he was going home with his black eye and his, his dirty shoes, he carried his shoes home and his father said, son, what are you doing? My dad turned to his dad and said, you paid too much for my shoes to get messed up. And when we think about what it means to live with different motives, we think about the fact that our lives are far more valuable than a pair of shoes. Our cost paid was far more valuable than a paycheck or even a year's wages. Jesus Christ died to pay for our sins, to redeem our lives, to buy us again. And because he paid the price, we now have a new motive, a motive to talk right, a motive to do what is right, a motive to be right, because he paid too much for us to go back. He died to, and, and paid too much for us to rebel. His blood is worth too much for us to live beneath who God calls us to be. The motivation of Christ is our motivation to live holy. So to live holy is to live with a different mind. To live holy is to live with a different mission. And lastly, Peter suggests to live holy is to live with a, I'm sorry, I messed it up. It's to live with a different mind. Everybody say mind, follow me. And I hope I get it right. <laughs> to live holy is to live with a different motive. There we go. And lastly, finally, perhaps Peter suggests to live holy is to live with a different mission. Live with a different mission. Amen. Verse 22, Peter admonishes us saying, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. And I love the way that our drama team uh, exemplified this scripture. Love one another deeply from the heart. Here, Peter suggests that our mission, should we accept it, is to love one another from the depths of our hearts. And some might call this orthopathy or right feeling, how we feel about God and others while this first element of his letter are very encouraging because it's all about us, this latter element of Peter's letter is all about the other. 
Because the true test of God's love is not just how much we love ourselves. The true test of God's love is demonstrated in how well we love each other. The key to our redemption is the way that we treat others whom God has redeemed. I am holy because he is holy, and so are you. Therefore, my mission, should I choose to accept it, is to love you as Christ loved me. And he said so himself that we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. But even Jesus knew that this would be a hard mission. Jesus knew that it's easy to love those who love you, but it's hard, dare I say impossible, to love people who you don't even like. It is a hard mission to love those within the body of Christ, and it is a harder mission to love those you don't even like. So our mission, should we choose to accept it, is to love our enemies and to love our friends, to love our haters and to love our fans. Our calling is to live holy and the call is to love holy, believing that no one is beneath the redeeming love of God. There's this wonderful uh, ser series, this television series and movie, you probably know it, Mission Impossible. <laughs> And I love the way Mission Impossible starts. I know you hear the theme song in your mind already, don't you? I won't sing it. I will stick with the text. <laughs> and so I can hear the theme song playing in my mind, and every single movie opens the same. Somebody is caught in the middle of a situation that looks awful, and Ethan Hawke is trying to get his way out. And then there's some comedic moment, and then he wins the victory. And then he gets the call. And the call says, Ethan Hawke, this is your mission should you choose to accept it. And every single time, the mission is dangerous. Every single time, the mission is costly. Every single time, the mission involves death. Every single time, the mission is risky. But by the end of the movie, the result is always the same. The mission was impossible, but it was successful in the end. And before the movie's over, there's a sneak peek to the next. Ethan Hawke, this is your mission, should you choose to accept it. And as I reflect on this movie, as I reflect on this role of Ethan Hawke, I remember that we are all called to accept a mission. We are all given an opportunity to accept an invitation. And this invitation is an invitation to love others with the love we have received by Christ because this is how the world will know that we are holy. This is how the world will know that we are his disciples by our love one for another. And so the mission will be dangerous. The mission will be costly. The mission will cause you to want to throw in the towel. The mission will make you want to give up sometimes. But this mission, should you choose to accept it, has already been victorious because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has already bought, fought the battle. And Jesus Christ has already paid the price. So our mission while impossible is possible with God. Our mission, while dangerous, is all right with God. And our mission is not just until the end of this world, but our mission doesn't end until Christ comes for us again. And so I say to you, live holy because you are holy. Be holy because he is holy. And when he comes back for us one day, let us hear hear him say, well done. This world was hard, but you accomplished your mission. You wanted to cry, but you accomplished your mission. Well done, my good and faithful and holy servant of God. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the reminder that we don't have to fight to be who you called us to be. So we confess, God, that we've often tried to be other things, other people. We've tried to be who we thought we wanted to be. But Lord, thank you for the reminder that we are holy because you, you are holy. And your holiness 
It's what allows us to live with different minds. Your holiness is what allows us to live with different motives. And, oh, God, it is your holiness alone that gives us a different mission. So, Lord, thank you for your calling. Thank you for the mission. I pray for every person here whose mission maybe feels impossible. I pray for the reminder, God, that because of Christ, we can do all things, even living holy. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
never lose his power. It's the blood of Jesus that is bringing redemption in the world. And we just want to give God honor and thanks as we turn our hearts towards interceding through the prayers of the people. What we're going to do is we're going to um, pray for the world, pray for the nation, and pray for our communities. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to sing the refrain, heal the land, Meet the need, set the captives free. Can y'all sing it real quick? Lord, we first want to ask that you truly would heal our land. As I talk to different people around the world, they're being affected by the different climate changes and, and ways that patterns that they could depend on for centuries, they can't depend on anymore. And it's causing people to move and causing different types of disruptions. So we pray for healing, Lord. We pray for healing of the nations that there's more nationalism happening all around the world and polarization, a lack of hospitality uh, for the other, Lord. And so we pray for healing. We pray for the, the, the pillaging of resources that are happening, that redemption and uh, justice will happen in Africa, that people will no longer uh, pillage the most resource-rich continent and cripple the economy of the people in that continent. But Lord, we pray also for our brothers and sisters in China that are dealing with the coronavirus, that you would truly bring some healing, Lord. 
whether it's economic, whether it's ecological, or whether it is biological, Lord, we pray that you would heal our world. In Jesus' name we pray. This is the year of 2020. It's an election year. We're in the midst of an impeachment trial. We have a lot of polarization in our country. But it's not only in our country, it's also in our churches. And like my sister Sandra and also says, that I pray that you will help us to understand every political issue as a pastoral concern. And so Lord, help us to engage these political issues as pastoral concerns for our brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, that you would be with all of those folks who are grieving right now with the nine who are lost in this terrible helicopter accident. I pray that you would use this opportunity for people to draw near to you because you're near to the brokenhearted. And even as we approach this Super Bowl, which is one of the greatest times of human trafficking, sex trafficking that happens in our country, Lord, I pray that you would heal both the perpetrators and the victims. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Lord, all of us have left a home. We are coming from somewhere. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with those who we've left, that you would protect them, that you would console them. Lord, there's some of us that do come into this place with a heavy heart and our attentions might be divided. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, bring some peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, I pray uh, whatever our city uh, that we live in or our, our region, Lord, we pray that you would bring your kingdom come that is in the city of God that's in heaven will become the city of God that's in our locale. I pray, Lord, that you would teach our churches uh, not to just be a social club, but to be a reconciling community. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that there is no plan B. Discipleship through your church is your answer for healing in the world, that we may be your hands and feet and your heart in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, amen. Okay, we've got one last song for y'all. It's a little groovy. Y'all ready? All right, all right. Put your hands together. Hey, hey. Oh, sing Christ is. Christ is the evidence of our God's unfailing love. 
as we depart to live out this call to live holy as our God is holy. Our God sends us forth now with a blessing. Receive these words of blessing. And now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.